I have the joy of being the last slot this afternoon, so I'm going to be very brief. Um, I'm going to share with you a little snapshot of a project that I've been working on since it started in 2005, TESA, Teacher Education in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to take you thousands of miles away to countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. As the title says, the focus of our work is teachers. So for us, the learners are teachers. Uh, the purpose of TESA is to improve teachers' classroom practices. We're trying to support teachers to develop much more inclusive pedagogy, pedagogy that aims for all children to reach their potential, to improve their achievements, uh, including those children who are vulnerable, marginalized. And there are rather a lot of those currently in classrooms in sub-Saharan Africa who are unfortunately not achieving great things. So uh, I know that many people in the room already know quite a bit about TESA, so I'm going to fairly whiz through um, what the project is about. There's lots more detail on our website. We are an international network. There's about 20 institutions and organizations working collaboratively, led by my own institution, the Open University in the UK. We, our solution to the challenge of teacher education in sub-Saharan Africa has been to collaboratively, and that, I think that's really important, to collaboratively develop a bank of open educational resources to support teachers' development. So the learning outcomes, and there are very explicit learning outcomes in our materials, those learning outcomes are for the teacher, they are not for the pupil. And we wrote all those materials to a uh, defined template, something that we spent quite a lot of time developing collectively. Um, so there's consistency across all the materials. Having developed these materials collaboratively with around 100 academics across um, 10 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, we have then adapted them through quite a formal process for all the different environments in, in which we're working. That's now 12 different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So the materials are now available in 12 different versions, including in four languages, English, Arabic, French, and Kiswahili. They're also available in several different formats. So the template is a, is a study unit. Um, and I'm not going to sort of spend time now, there isn't time to go through what's in the template, but the template is a study unit that has activities for the teacher to do in their classroom with their pupils. It has case studies, it has supporting materials like lesson plans, examples of pupils' work, and so on. Those study units are available as web pages, but they're also available as PDFs and as Word documents. And most of our users, most of the teachers who are engaging with the TESA material see them in hard copy. They have them as print books. Most of them have probably never seen the TESA website. Most of them, dare I say this, probably don't know their open educational resources and they certainly don't know very much about licensing. But for them, they are materials that are relevant to their context. And we have then worked with our partners to integrate these TESA OER into a wide range of different programs at the partner institutions. So currently, they're being used in 20 programs, courses of study um, across these different countries. So I'm just going to share with you here a few examples of where they're being used. So sometimes, as in Tanzania, people took the TESA materials and use them as the basis of a new program. So at the Open University of Tanzania, they have a diploma in primary education. It's actually the first diploma in primary education in the whole of Tanzania. Up until development of this diploma, there was only a certificate for primary teachers. So they used the TESA materials as the basis of about 40% of the materials for this new program. But in many other partner institutions, the materials have been integrated into existing programs of study to enrich them, to enhance them, and most importantly, actually, to increase the emphasis on practice. In far too many of the institutions that we're working with, the teachers spend most of their time in sessions like this, actually, where there are probably hundreds of them, 
listening to how to teach rather than having opportunities to engage in practice themselves. So integrating the tests and materials into these programs means that there's a shift towards a greater emphasis, a greater valuing of the practicum. So what are we seeing? Um, we've got about 400,000 teachers who've been using these materials. And one of the things that we've been doing all through this project is also engaging in research. It was interesting yesterday that one of the four asks that the Hewlett Foundation put up was the, the demand for more research. We've been trying to do that all through our project and our current Hewlett grant. We are looking at different sort of planes of analysis around TESA use, looking at teacher educators, looking at teachers in the classrooms with their pupils. And what are we finding? Um, we are finding, we're very excited by this, emerging evidence of changes in pedagogy, sustainable shifts in teachers' pedagogy, changes in the relationships between the teachers and the learners, whether those teachers are teacher educators, people like myself in, in other institutions, um, or school teachers, but changes in the, the dialogue that's going on between the teachers and the learners. Kind of very small shifts so far, but shifts from kind of vertical expertise to much more horizontal expertise. Much more um, um, release of creativity from both teachers and learners, and drawing on people's prior funds of knowledge. So not treating learners as if they, they were blank slates or empty vessels. So this is all very exciting, and I thought it might just be useful here to, to share a few ideas about how we've managed to get to this point. Um, I don't think there's anything new in the factors that I've drawn out. I think over the last 24 hours, somebody has mentioned all of these factors. Um, but I would suggest that it's not just serendipity that we see these factors in the institutions that are using our materials. And some of our partner institutions, I will be honest, are not engaging in very great use of the materials. There have been some quite substantial barriers to use of the materials. But in other institutions, there's been fantastic take up and engagement with the project. So the kinds of things that um, I think have been influential in ensuring that we have take up are, first of all, the quality of the materials. Uh, I think this is back to what some people were talking about yesterday, the idea of branding. People know that all the materials are written to the same template. They can easily find their way around them. There's a very strong, a consistent pedagogic approach that runs through all the materials. So they're conceptually sound, even though they've been adapted for different environments. However, I do have a worry that perhaps that kind of high quality limits the share back. Um, we have an area of our website called Tessa Share. So far, we have failed, I think we could say honestly, to encourage very many teachers or teacher educators to share back further adaptations of the materials. So perhaps the kind of highly finished nature of them deters people from wanting to share back what they've done with them. Um, the materials, as I've tried to indicate, are very flexible. They can be used in lots of different programs uh, with different levels, whether there's certificate programs, Bachelor of Education programs, just unaccredited inset programs. So they're, they're very flexible. And, that, and I think one of the things that allows them to be used in such a multitude of programs is that they don't have any assessment associated with them. The assessment in all those programs belongs to the institutions who are using them. So they're the people who accredit the teachers as they work through the programmes. But I do sometimes worry, and uh, my colleague Jophus, who's here somewhere, and I have discussed this at length, about when people just take very small parts of the study units, very granular um, pieces from the materials, whether there is a kind of loss of coherence to the learning some of the teachers experience. Um, it's very difficult to know whether that is the case or not, um, but it's something that does concern us. Maybe the level of granularity that we have in the materials is too large. 
Um, obviously, use is very dependent on having adequate resource. As I indicated, most of the teachers receive them in hard copies, so somebody has to pay for the printing of the booklets and the kind of distribution to those teachers. But I, I think I would argue that equally important is that teachers have time to experiment with the resources. That all too often, if I dare say this, sometimes funders as well are very anxious to see results impact very quickly. And teachers need time to make mistakes, to kind of reflect on their practice. Um, and they also need space, safe spaces, what perhaps we might term hybrid spaces. With our, our partner in Sudan, we did a participatory photography project where we gave teachers disposable cameras and asked them to take pictures of when they did something different in their practice. Um, I mean, one of the reasons for doing that was there was rather a language barrier between us and, and the teachers. But it was very interesting to look at these pictures and to interview the teachers about them. Many of the photographs weren't of the formal classroom. They were of the teachers running a club, running an assembly, or out in the schoolyard, where they were able to organise the children into groups and move around the groups. And they were able to say how easy it was to do that. And one of the reasons that we would suggest that they are doing that outside the classroom is that there aren't the expectations that there are in the classroom of how you should behave. Uh, there are very, very strong cultural expectations in many of these countries of pupil and teacher behaviour. And we're trying to disrupt those. And that's difficult. Uh, just whiz through a few more. Um, a whole TESA project has worked as a very iterative process. All the time we're gathering data, feeding it back into the guidance um, and advice that we're working with partners on generating. But one of the things that we don't feel we have enough of is feedback from teachers to um, people who are developing the materials, to teacher educators. And I think that goes to the heart of the project. Actually, what we're about is changing the nature of the dialogue between teacher educators and teachers. And so getting many teacher educators to listen to teachers, not just talk at them, is, is really difficult. And that means that so far, I don't think we're getting enough feedback from teachers. Um, and just to finish a couple more, I think we have been very helped by having supportive education policies. And these are not policies that are around open content. But these are policies in, in virtually every country in which we're working which advocate learner-centred education. And although we don't set ourselves up as promoting learner-centred education, um, the materials really advocate an active learning approach that fits in and can be seen as a response to these policies. So policymakers are looking for solutions of how to implement learner-centred education. So in a way, we're using our, our, that as a kind of the way in, you know, with the OER as kind of there, rather hidden. Um, just whiz through a couple more. Um, the, the OER that we've developed do have a very innovative pedagogy in them, uh, pedagogy that challenges prevailing hierarchical teacher-learner relations, but the materials look very familiar to teachers because all the activities and all the examples that are in there are from the national curriculum of that country. So there's nothing in there that they feel is additional to what they have to teach. So we are use, using the, the um, topics that they are required to be engaging with in their classroom to introduce them to a different pedagogy. And finally, um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the value of support support for the teacher educators through the TESSA network. We have regular face-to-face -face meetings as well as virtual communication. And for the teachers in the schools, where many of the teacher educators are, um, are sort of carrying out a kind of brokering role, they're supporting the teachers in these changes in their practices. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I must say personally, I'm.
deeply grateful for the work you're doing. This is extremely important, obviously, where education is most needed and, you know, where OER R has the greatest potential and just want to uh, say again, thank you for, for your contributions. Um, we have time for one or two quick comments. Andrew? Um, I think to some degree in America we take technology for granted, but I realize you probably don't have as much access or your teachers don't to computers and other resources. I'm curious what technology you do use. Is it cell phones, computers? What, what access do your teachers have? Um, we use whatever's there. Yeah. So <laughs> What's the thing that's there uh, so, the most? So the, the teacher educators, people working in a partner institution, for example, University of Cape Coast in, in Ghana, would access the materials online. Um, but they would probably download them, possibly to their intranet if they have one. But many of these partner institutions don't have intranets. Um, possibly would burn them to CDs, because we have that a very easy facility to do that on the website and maybe distribute those. But more likely than not, they download them because they come as nicely produced PDFs and they send those to the local printer who they've been working with for 50 years. And he or she you know, creates thousands of copies of the materials and then they distribute them. But uh, the mobiles is an interesting question. The, our resources, and I think this was mentioned yesterday, have not been designed to be used on a small screen, uh, partly because when we were designing them five or six years ago, uh, mobiles weren't quite so ubiquitous. But last month I was in Ghana, and for the, although there's been a lot of talk about mobiles, for the first time ever, a teacher showed me that she was looking at the TESA website on her mobile. You know, I observed her lesson. I said, well, you know, where did you get the idea from for that lesson? And she said, oh, from TESA. And I said, which one? And she got out her phone and she showed me. And I don't think that was kind of set up. Sometimes these things can be slightly staged when you go there and you, um, from the project. But, but it, so people are beginning to access them. But for us, that's going to be a challenge because at the moment, the materials are not really designed. They don't, they're not easy to read on a, a small screen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you again.